This is Supernatural Selection on DeviantBehaviorRadio.com Hosted by Kevin the Bastard Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the latest episode of Supernatural Selection. I'm your host, Kevin the Bastard. With me again this week is Mr. David Davis. Davis, how you doing, buddy? I am doing quite well, actually. Uh, things are going okay over here, so... Fantastic. I have been really excited about this episode this week. I would love to talk about it with you. Let's talk about this. Uh, I know we normally go into like a lot of... Uh, like just general chit chat but like this is a big discussion that i'm excited about it ties into my family history and i want to talk about this well excellent i hope that we uh, enjoy ourselves with this one so i'm gonna start off by asking you kevin what do you know about the falc monster well let me say that i have seen legend of boggy creek with my father i know the general history of the thing it is a bigfoot type Perry Bidepid from Arkansas. Uh, it is permanently linked to folk music in my mind <laughs> or falk music. Ooh, if boo. you care to go there. Boo. Yeah, I know. It's terrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, well, we won't be getting into the music aspect in this episode. Um, That's good because it's terrible. Now, notice that I mentioned this episode because we are doing our first two-parter. <laughs> I'm excited about this, man. I'm so excited that we're doing a two-parter, and I'm excited that you are at the tiller for this because you have done some amazing outlines, and this is definitely the episode to do a two-parter on. Yeah, so like, I want to say that it's definitely worthy of a two-parter, but it also may just be being unable to edit myself. So we'll, (laughs) we'll find out by the end of these two episodes. Um. That's fine. You know what? I think people are going to find this really interesting because I know I did. Right, and I think we're going to have a little bit of an interesting spin on it, so I'll kind of dive into that as we go. So, the story of the Falk Monster is familiar to many a child of the 1970s as the Boggy Creek Monster. Absolutely. Now, it is a story about a... The story that we're going to be telling today is a story about a town, a man, and if you believe it, an actual monster. I'm sorry, I don't believe it. Well, hopefully we make a believer out of you. I hope so, because this is an amazing story, and I want to get this out there. (laughs) So, in order to tell this story in the most appropriate way possible, I think we need to start with the story of Charles B. Pierce, the filmmaker who we can generally credit with putting Falk, and more specifically its monster, on that cryptid map. Yeah, I agree. This guy, I mean, if you're you're a Mystery Science Theater fan, they did the Legend of Bobby boggy creep 2 mm-hmm. uh as an episode which is great but like i think the first episode the first movie pardon me is mm-hmm. fantastic you really yeah. need to check that out it is its own animal entirely it's not more of a docudrama as opposed to uh a Like a more traditional movie like Boggy Creek 2 was. Yeah, absolutely. Because that was much more of a traditional film, filmed with quote-unquote actors, heavily Mm. on the (laughs) quote-unquote. So, um, as far as our source for this episode, I'm working with Lyle Blackburn's book, The Beast of Boggy Creek, The True Story of the Falk Monster. Uh, Are you familiar with Lyle Blackburn at all? I am not, but after you've mentioned it in the outline, I intend to pick up this book as soon as possible and read it myself because you know me. I'm a big fan of uh, su- southeastern United States monsters. And uh, the cool thing about Lyle Blackburn is he, at this point, I would probably consider him like the preeminent folklorist regarding all things Boggy Creek, all things Falk. Um, Which is great. I first I first stumbled onto him when I was watching that first uh, Joe Bob Briggs Last Drive-In Marathon on Shudder, because they did The Legend yeah. of Boggy Creek, and he was there as a guest. Really? Yes, so he was That's talking about awesome. the movie and everything like that, because the, the cool thing about Lyle Blackburn is he's also a musician, so like when he talks about The Legend of Boggy Creek, he talks about the film, he talks about the lore, he talks about the music, uh, just generally Our- everything. I really want to point out how important the music is for this episode, mm-hmm. uh, or for that ep- that movie in particular, because 
Holy shit, there's a lot of folk music for that episode. In fact, I would go as far to call it folk music. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Because it is really specifically bent on the legend of Boggy Creek. Right. Uh, as far as other sources, I have a few smaller sources. I consult, like, census data. Yes, we're going to be getting into the weeds with some data in this episode. Um, but I also consult the uh, legend of Boggy Creek website. I love so. you for getting that deep into this. Let me just say that before we move on. Right. Well, you know... It, we have to also contextualize a lot of what happens with like historical data and the landscape and population itself. And you'll, you'll hear as we go through. Absolutely. We'll get into that as we move on. Now I'm going to say that Blackburn's book is solid. It's written pretty well, very informative. It's also just skeptical enough. You can tell Blackburn is a believer of some of the information that he's talking about, but he also does a good job of, you know, treating it with a grain of salt and debunking it. It's also a little over 200 pages, which is a nice little uh, weekend read, I think. I agree, and I love books that are just skeptical enough. That's why mm -hmm. I love uh, the Jerome Clark books, because they're not like, the, oh, this is real. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of skepticism in it, so I really love that. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to dive into our episode, and what I want to do is I want to bookend this entire discussion with Charles B. Pierce. Please so, do. Um, one of the main reasons we're even talking about the Falk monster today, and that's Falk spelled F-O-U-K-E, uh, is due to the efforts of this man, Charles B. Pierce. Charles B. Pierce was born June 16th, 1938 in Hammond, Indiana. He was a resident of Arkansas for most of his life. Like many children with access to a camera at the time, he would shoot a lot of 8mm films. And that is entirely true, because uh, speaking as a child of the 80s, if you had a uh, access to a camera, you would often do short films, or you would do like cheesy little camera tricks, like mm -hmm. somebody force choking someone else and someone would disappear. We shot multiple short films on cameras uh and this is this is just what you did mm -hmm. at the time you know and i uh i had access to like camera technology but i never i never really did this like i'm starting to get into it now but for some reason like it never clicked for me for me it was always uh comic books and writing but uh, that's understandable yeah yeah but i'm starting I to mean, get into the idea of making movies more well, you had to have friends that either had uh, large court settlements or <laughs> rich, or rich to begin with, that had cameras, and you would like do goofy tricks, and you'd be like, "What if we put a story to this? That would yeah. be really cool." And we ended up doing like a lot of comedy or horror films mm -hmm. uh, set to these cameras. So I totally get that you get access to a camera. And suddenly you're like, I can do this. I can be the next. I don't know who it would have been back in the 60s, but today it would, today it would have been like the next Spielberg. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I did some shooting in high school. A lot, not not like school shooting, but like uh, <laughs> uh, like <laughs> shoot, like, like uh, camera stuff for like the morning announcements because we had like video announcements in the morning and I used to do the editing for that. That was fun, but... Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, like, a lot of kids at the time who had access to a camera, he would shoot these kind of movies and that sort of thing. Uh, so around the mid-1960s, he took a job at KTAL-TV in Shreveport, Louisiana. Hot dang, that's down near my neck of the woods. You, you, you all there, bound down by Shreveport? Well, let me tell you about Shreveport down there. You gotta get them mud bucks before that rain drowns them. <laughs> It's great how you just kind of slip into that accent. That's fantastic. It's so close to home. I can't <laughs> explain it. Um, so yeah, he takes this job at KTAL uh, TV as an art director, and then he'd he'd later work as like a weatherman and host a children's cartoon show. I'm not gonna um, lie. That's kind of the uh, that's kind of the goal for everyone because nobody gives a shit what you do. On a children's television show, you show Popeye cartoons, and you get weird. Mm -hmm. 
And then, of course, being the weatherman, you're like a local celebrity. Oh, absolutely, man. Yeah, o- over here in California in L.A., we have Dallas Rains, which is like the most perfect weatherman name. We had a guy here named, uh, I can't actually remember his name, but we had a uh, homosexual uh, weatherman, and <laughs> his uh, his symbol for snow looked like semen raining on Jackson. And we thought it was <laughs> fucking hilarious. Cause oh, like, that's, that's oh, it was Rex Thompson. Because when it was the semen raining, we said it was the Rex Nad weather. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, um, uh, Charles would continue to kind of like work across Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas. He eventually moved to Texarkana in oh. 1969. And started his own advertisement agency. <laughs> oh, God, I am so sorry. Now, Moving see, I, to Texarkana. Now, I, I've never been to Texarkana, so I'm not sure like how I've, concerned I should be. I'm close, and I've just heard stories the fa- that are two Texarkanas. It's like there's not enough bullshit for one Texarkana. They had to make two. Yeah, well, we'll talk a little bit about how it's divided up. If we're going to so, get into that. Yeah. Um, so this move to Texarkana would actually be, like, very important, and his advertising mm-hmm. work would put him in touch with a number of people in the area. Um, eventually, uh, when he starts his project, he would convince uh, L.W. Ledwell, which is which just sounds like a businessman's name. Oh, yeah. Um, so he, he would talk to L.W. Ledwell, a local business owner, uh, and he'd talk him into financing $100,000 of the $160,000 budget for Pierce's first movie, which is The Legend of Boggy Creek. Okay, first off, that is a lot of money for your first investment. That is like over half of your investment. Secondly, this is kind of starting to sound like Ed Wood going to the Baptist church, getting <laughs> his uh, his investment, but minus the cross-dressing. And Bela Lugosi. <laughs> and the heroine. <laughs> and the biopic, now that I think about it. Actually, they need to do a biopic about this called The Legend of the Legend of Boggy Creek, because I would watch that. Yeah, me too. I think I think his story is like interesting enough, and it's so intertwined with this event. It, it really is. This would be an amazing film if anybody wants to go into it. So if you're listening and you happen to have, like some investment like $160,000 I would definitely say go into a movie about this about Pierce this Mm -hmm. is amazing so he wore many hats as an independent filmmaker he was a director screenwriter producer set decorator cinematographer and actor and over the span of his career, he would direct 13 films, and is to considered, and he's considered to be one of like the first modern independent filmmakers, in the sense that he produced and assembled his films outside of the studio system that dominated the industry over the prior like 50 or 60 years. Yeah. So his two biggest films were um, the 1976 horror classic *The Town That Dreaded Sundown*. I have got to see that, by the way. It, it's very, very song. good. Interrupt. It's very good. I have heard about that, and it sounds amazing because it's about a Texarkana serial killer. Mm -hmm. And it feels really modern in a lot of ways. It's it's definitely um, uh, like it it was it was a couple years after um, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but it's along that same kind of line of it being forward thinking, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Would you say it's exploitative? In a way? Mm, maybe. Maybe a little bit. It, it has that kind of, like, uh, I, I guess you call it, like, cinema verite style. Right. Yeah. Um, but we're we're going to focus today on his most impactful film, which was 1972's The Legend of Boggy Creek. Now, a lot of people will badmouth this film, but you really need to see it. Well, and those people are assholes, because... They really movie. are. Yeah. Um, another fun fact about him that I just felt like including, what's one of the most iconic Clint Eastwood lines that, that exists in film? Go ahead, make my day. And Charles B. Pierce is the one who wrote it. That the, is uh, amazing. Yeah, he was a, a script contributor to uh, Sudden Impact, that Dirty Harry movie. 
So, yeah. Yeah. He, you know, he gave us Boggy Creek, the town that dried at sundown, and go ahead, make my day. Look, this guy should be in some kind of a museum just for that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the particularly charming parts about Lyle Blackburn's accounting of all of this is that he kind of describes Pierce as a sort of, like, prototypical DIY guy. And, you know, I get that. I have a, re- a lot of respect for this guy. I've done a lot of films myself. I may have mentioned that in uh, your new podcast, mm-hmm. Kid Stuff. Uh, I have done a lot of short films over the years. Uh and this guy really managed to convey mood really well. Uh, mm-hmm. They're not awards material by any means, but there's a charm to them. They definitely feel like they're from Arkansas. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's just, it feels like you could believe it. And I give him a really high level of kudos for that. This guy's films... Uh, the first one, particularly, really works as a documentary film. Yeah, and uh, one thing that I'd like to talk about a little bit, just uh, just for a second, is like his his photographic eye, because like some of the some of the shots of like the landscape in uh, Legend of Boggy Creek are just absolutely beautiful, and I'm just thinking oh, sh- like, what um, what if yes. he had an HD camera at the time? Just how freaking gorgeous would that movie be my god if this guy had modern technology with him it would be amazing because like i mean the whole like okay even with the fake bigfoot costume in the (laughs) film it is still amazing work this guy definitely knew what he was doing i give him a lot of credit for that because speaking as a former director producer writer Mm -hmm. uh camera operator all that stuff it's not easy to do Mm -hmm. so he is i I give him a lot of kudos for that well and i'm glad you mentioned the uh the bigfoot costume because what we're dealing with isn't necessarily it isn't entirely a documentary there are some elements that are generated for the film so so part of the reason the legend of boggy creek had such an impact was his treatment of the subject matter Um, It was the first in a wave of what we would kind of call, like, well, not the first, but one of the first in a wave of what we would call docudramas. So what do you know about docudramas? Well, docudramas are basically where a director takes the idea and tries to make something that feels like a documentary but involves actors or sometimes the original people involved in in, in the story uh, portraying themselves. And uh, it it basically comes off feeling either very realistic or very stupid. Mm -hmm. That or it's a sandwich. I don't (laughs) quite remember. I'm a little tired right now and confused. So it's either a really well-made documentary involving actors or a sandwich available at Schlotsky's. Okay, so it is not a sandwich. But okay, otherwise, good. You're, you're, you're spot on with that. <laughs> All right. So, um, so it's this attention to authenticity as a docudrama. It, it, it's what helped make the uh, help the film to make a strong impact in the minds of those people who saw it. Oh uh, man, it, yeah. It's a very frightening movie to a great deal of the audience because of this like documentary style, and it, it just makes it feel more real. Hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and quote Lyle Blackburn here from the book when he writes, "Quote." I was fortunate enough to catch the legend of Boggy Creek at an old Texas drive-in as a child, so I can attest to the validity of these reactions. For me and countless others at the time, the tale of Boggy Creek was more than just a legend. Dot, dot, dot. It was real! End quote. (laughs) It was real! It was real! Unexplained! Unexplained! (laughs) Um, I'm surprised that's not mentioned in my my book by uh, Jerome Clark, but... You know, there you go. Well, what when was Jerome's book written? Uh, well, the second edition was around two thousand ninety nine, sometime around the Gopher sites. Okay, and he he, uh, you know, uh, it, it's okay. Like, there's been plenty of written. There's been plenty written about the Boggy Creek monster. There really so, has. Yeah. But um, that brings me up uh, to this point. Like, what was your f- reaction the first time you saw the movie? Now, let me start off by saying that I've got a real personal experience with this film. My dad being... Let's get personal. 
Bow, bow. So, my father, the last time he went and saw a movie in the theater was The Legend of Boggy Creek. And that was wow. in Morton, Mississippi in the 70s. <laughs> and he just didn't go because, like, my sister tried to get him to go to see Alien. And my dad was like, are you nuts? Now, now that's that's interesting to me that like Alien and Boggy Creek were in the theater at the exact same time, and that, yeah, like, what a what a difference in like um, holy shit, I like, know budget, it's, you know what I mean? I know. So he always talked about the movie uh, when I was a kid. He talked about we saw this one movie about Bigfoot, some kind of Bigfoot monster, <laughs> and uh, this guy's taking a shit. <laughs> in the bathroom, and this monster arm reaches and tries to get him. And this guy jumps up and re runs out of the toilet, and the whole theater started laughing. <laughs> so he told me about this when I was a kid, and there was no way to get a hold of this when I was a kid in the eighties and, and and early nineties. So you cut to shortly before my father died when Amazon became a thing, and I found it. The Legend of Boggy Creek was on Amazon. I was like, well, shit, I have to get it. So I get it, and me and him watch it. I'm gonna lie. I'm not going to lie. I enjoy this movie so much. This mm -hmm. guy put so much, for lack of a better term, pathos into this film. It's like, you know when you make a bad movie and it's like you don't put a lot of effort into it and it's obvious? Mm hmm Pierce put a lot of work into The Legend of Boggy Creek. Mm hmm So we're sitting there watching it shortly before my father passes away and he sits there and constantly goes, I'm sorry, can we, we, we can stop this. And I'm like, oh no! No, you have been hyping that man on the toilet getting attacked by a Bigfoot for 30 years. We are fucking watching <laughs> this movie, damn it. And it was really impressive. Mm -hmm. As a film about a, a freaking cryptid in Arkansas, I was thoroughly impressed, even with like the 30 minutes of... Silk music, let's call it that. Hey, Joseph Crabtree. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that kind of crap. Just like, oh, Mr. Monster, you're living out in the swamp. <laughs> Mr. Crabtree, you're living out there. It's just so stupid, but I love it. I <laughs> fucking love it. And I wouldn't have even known about this if it hadn't been for my dad. And I'm <laughs> so glad he introduced me to this. Due to a man being attacked on the shitter. <laughs> well, well, speaking of pathos, you're going to make me cry, man. That's a that's a really beautiful story. Well, thank you. I'm glad you like it because, like, seriously, that is it, it's, like, really important to my family. Yeah. Well, I mean, it had everything. It had familial bonding. It had a dude shitting on a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, it, it's it's a really it's a really good story, and I'm just so happy you get to share that because that's yeah. like it's about those memories. You know what I mean? It really is. I mean, like my dad's been gone for like Jesus seven years now, and like mm -hmm. anytime I get to share a story about that something like that, I always feel worried about it. Mm -hmm. So let's move on beyond my personal connections with Boggy Creek. Yeah, what else let's move got? on before we both start crying. Yes, um. absolutely. <laughs> So, um, while I would be hard-pressed to consider Charles B. Pierce a believer in what was dubbed the Falk Monster, he was definitely, like, even-handed in his exploration, and he kind of strove for authenticity. Um, how he came to know about the Falk Monster, whatever, was through the news. Uh, like, and the, this flap, I, I'm going to call it the Falk Flap, um, <laughs> was, was big news for a couple of years. So, uh, I'm going to quote Blackburn here again, where he writes, quote, Yeah. Like all residents of Texarkana in the early 1970s, Pierce had been following the sensational newspaper reports describing a hairy, ape-like creature which haunted the creeks near Falk. As a result of his interest in the stories, he conceived of an idea for doing a regional film based on the phenomenon, end quote. 
Well, that is the smartest thing you could do because, holy shit, that is going to make a lot of money. You, you know, when I when I teach, uh, like, essay craft to my students, one of those things that I talk about, like, we have ethos, pathos, and logos, obviously, mm -hmm. but the other thing is uh, kairos, or, like, that opportunity, and this is, like, a perfect example of kairos, or getting that timing right. Absolutely. There was something in the air, he recognized it, and he ran with it. And we don't get a lot of that these days, because mm -hmm. the internet diffuses these ideas across the world mm. like back then you would get like us like you said in the in the newspaper you would get like these ideas centered and everybody would grab onto it and then you could make a movie about this mm -hmm. so well, like back in the day you used to have like local reporters now everything's kind of run through the ap yeah i mean i found a friggin article from our local paper in something from uh i want to say it was somewhere up in the midwest mm -hmm. and i was like it was about a local gallery closing i'm like i don't think you guys need to know about that right yeah so um with that, before we continue following Pierce's contribution to the legendary status of the Falk monster, uh, I think we need to kind of cover the evolution of, like, local stories that caught his attention. Yes. So, in case we missed the description of the creature just now, you know, and then earlier on, this is a Bigfoot episode. Yes. This is certainly a ghost monkey episode i hate that term so much <laughs> i know you do but i can't help it that's my phrase oh my god okay it's ghost so, monkeys oh no um so what i want to do here is um i want to talk a little bit about like that the region where all of this takes place because that plays a lot into this story now, having a fiancé from Arkansas, I've been through a few of these areas, so it's really interesting, and I'll throw some ideas in there as we go. Yeah, you're closest to that area, so I, I definitely I hear am. your thoughts on this. So, while we can credit Pierce a great deal for the fact we are talking about the Falk monster today, it also helps that the sightings of such a creature were common enough and distinctive enough that the creature would still be known to us today. Like, it just it happened There's... that much... Yeah. Yes, there's enough going on with this thing that even if it weren't as populous or popular as it is now, somebody would be talking about it because there's just enough weird shit with it mm -hmm. that somebody would be talking about it. So, it was a very hot topic of the late 1960s and early 1970s in the Texarkana area, and, uh, that even without the movie, the Texarkana Bigfoot, we could call it, would be in any number of, like, Usenet groups and cryptid guides today. That's really true, and to be honest, the only thing, other thing we'd be talking about is the Lover's Lane murders. So, you know, before we dive into kind of this history of these creatures' sightings, I want to talk a little bit about Texarkana and the larger area oh, yes, surrounding please. it. Please do. So, um, and I'm probably going to butcher a lot of these pronunciations because I'm a Southern Californian and I put weird emphasis on certain syllables. That's <laughs> so, fine. I'll correct you when you get there. Yeah. Like, okay, dude. So, uh, Texarkana consists of the twins. Uh, sorry. Um, you nailed it. You <laughs> yeah. actually nailed it. So, so Texarkana consists of the twin cities in what is called the Arklatex region of the state. Yes. So, ba basically, Arklatex is the border area of Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana. And the city is part of what you'd consider, like, a larger tri-state area and has Texarkana, Texas, and the twin city in Arkansas named, what else, but Texarkana. Now, that is not to be confused with Texarkana, Vermont. Is there an actual Texarkana, Vermont? There is not. I am full oh. of shit. There is... <laughs> Nobody in their right mind would call it Texarkana unless it was part of Texarkana, Texas, and Vermont. Now, I will say that uh, I have not been down there very much. I have been down near uh, Ar uh, Little Rock, which is a fantastic city, mm -hmm. but Texarkana, from everything I've heard, is kind of like just a, a haven of myth. 
<laughs> so it sounds like uh, my area then. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I, I live in a region that's notorious for meth- methamphetamines, so... Fantastic. <laughs> so there we go. So, um, this region where many of these sightings occurred is known as, like, Miller County, to Arkansas. I've read um, a little bit about it, thanks mm-hmm. to Kit. It's a naturally rugged area dotted with swamps and creeks, or if your mom, or if you're my mom, cricks. Cricks. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So according to the 2020 census, they only record about 43,000 residents. I'm willing to wager that is a rough estimate. It's closer to 4,300. <laughs> you know, um, it, like for a county that is, you'd say you'd say average, but then you have to think about like where these people are populated within the county itself because there's a lot of empty space. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about how sparse this area can be. But this makes Miller County the perfect environment for a monster. Absolutely. God, it's got this difficult, wild terrain, a relatively small population that's clustered together, and according to the 1970 census, the population of Miller County was only about 30,000 people. So they've had <laughs> some growth, but not a lot. <laughs> 30,000. Okay, first off, I love... How the 1970 census is the most recent we've got. And secondly, I can't imagine this place is going to hit a growth spurt anytime soon. Well, I'm going to correct you there because our, our, the 2020 census is the most recent one I could find. And that oh, was the I'm only 43,000 people. Okay. Wow. They must have had a lot of babies. Yeah, I, I, I guess. So. Well, that wait. So 19. Uh, okay. So 80s, 90s, 10s. or uh People just can't yeah. afford to move. Is what yeah, it amounts so, to. Yeah, so yeah, it, it it's so so basically, it's not a huge population over the no. course of since the nineteen seventies. It hasn't grown that much. <laughs> Definitely. Oh God, no. So you know, as for Falk, the location that would become the central area for these sightings, their current population in twenty twenty seems to be just over eight hundred people. That is not a surprise. I've been through a lot of Arkansas with my fiance. Uh-huh. I passed through a small town with a population of about 80 a few years ago, and they just, mm-hmm. according to the people in the gas station that <laughs> stopped in, they mm-hmm. just haven't updated the sign to reflect that there's only 50 people there. <laughs> and uh, they were down to 30 because 50 people have managed to move away. <laughs> so Arkansas is a very it it's not growing by any means. Yeah, especially with like COVID and such going on cuz I don't imagine a lot of people mask up in Arkansas. Yeah, well, you know there's that and then uh I hate to get like political but like I drove by a guy's house that had a sign that was a uh, rebel flag that said you can take it from my gold hit dead hands. Well, he'll be cold and dead soon enough thanks to the coronavirus. Fair, so. fair enough, yes. Yeah. It's it's <laughs> definitely a thing. You know, we're, we're a very liberal podcast here, apparently. Indeed. <laughs> um, so while the Texarkana area isn't overly sparse, it's still small enough that, like... It, it, that large portions of the area are still very much wild, and a lot of that is due to the landscape. That's very true. There are places in Arkansas where you can drive, and the only reason you know that it's civilization is because you're on a paved road. Well, okay, that and the banjo music. No one ever tell you you had a pretty mouth, boy? Man, they told me that so many times, it's ridiculous. Well, I can't usually respond because they put something in it. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, okay. The slurping <laughs> sounds get in the way. <laughs> so um, I'm going to go ahead and quote Lyle Blackburn here again because I don't want to spend a ton of time on the isolation of the area where all the sightings occurred. Um, but I think he sets the stage up pretty well in the book as to like why all this matters. So here are some brief numbers. Blackburn writes that, quote, the state boasts three national forests, which collectively engulf over 2.9 million acres, 9,000 miles of stream and river pathways, and upwards of 600,000 acres of sprawling lakes, end quote. Let me tell you, having driven through there, first off, being from Mississippi, 
seeing that many large rocks is kind of off-putting because I'm like, holy shit, look at the rocks. <laughs> Secondly, this is the kind of area where a cult would worship space lobsters and you wouldn't know for like a hundred <laughs> years. Which is weird because they're so inland. I know. <laughs> but like, you know, they live up in the Ozarks. Yeah. We live in the mountains. Would you like to come down and learn about our ways? We'll take your brain out. <laughs> um, so, regarding Falk, Blackburn writes, quote, in close proximity to the Red River and only a few miles southwest of Falk lies the vast Sulphur River bottoms, quote. He continues later saying, quote, the bottoms include the 18,000-acre Sulphur River Wildlife Management Area, end quote. This is also, like, connects to the larger Mississippi water web. Welcome to the Fart Stink National Forest. I'm sorry, <laughs> just... I mean, seriously... Sulfur River Bottoms. That sounds, sounds like a case of the Hershey Squirts. It really does. I'm so <laughs> glad you know what the Hershey Squirts are, so I, I don't have to explain them. <laughs> oh, God, help me. I need some Calamon. I got the Sulfur River Bottom. <laughs> uh, we're both adults. It's we great. are grown <laughs> humans. <laughs> But like this, <laughs> the Mississippi waterwebs, this kind of delves into my area. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of oxbow lakes, and I would love to do an episode about local uh, paranormal stuff. And I'm starting to work on that, so we'll get into that later. Maybe you'll be the Lyle Blackburn of Mississippi then. Damn right. There you go. <laughs> so, um... So this area in particular is more or less untouched by humans, but it's like this tangled series of patches of hardwoods, cypress trees, and a network of like creeks and lakes. So it's not the most no no navigatable terrain. As we can see, this is an area that is like absolutely prime for monster sightings. It's an area of low population density and a lot of territory that is just generally unfriendly to settlers. All right, I really need to point out that this is one of those few times where the white man coming into the area looked at an area that the Native Americans decided not to settle into, and everybody was like, oh, hell no, fuck that. <laughs> I'm not moving in there. I mean, like, seriously, if the Natives are not willing to move into there, your best bet is to just not move into there. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, speaking of settlers, um, sightings of something in Falk go back a long, long time, particularly sightings of what we would call wild men. So, Kevin, pray tell, have you ever heard tales of the wild men? And are we talking about real wild men or David Lee Roth? <laughs> yeah. All right, actually, there's two types that I'm familiar with. The first is your caveman-like guys, that live out in the woods like a feral hermit. Like the, uh, there's a guy that lived in, like, I want to say Canada that everyone mm -hmm. knew about that, like, everybody kept catching. And he was, like, raiding traps of beavers. And he's just this wild man. Mm -hmm. And then there's your legend, like, the one in Natchez of the, uh, wild man named Joe that they caught down in. Uh, Natchez on the railroad tracks, which I think mm -hmm. we've got a similar story coming up. But mm -hmm. the basic idea, basic idea is an ape man. So yeah. there's the two types. There's a caveman and the ape man. And I, I think you're exactly right. And I think we could probably do an entire episode that's just nothing but wild man stories. Oh, yeah. But, um, you know, wild men are like a common feature of cultures all over the world. You've got the Chinese Yeren to the British Wodwos. Uh, Wodwos! And, like, <laughs> and, you know, throughout human history, there are these sightings and tales of wild humans that pop up to remind people that there's a lot of, like, empty, end quote, uncivilized, unquote, land out there full of things that are, like, unknown and mysterious to Which, us. I love this idea because it's just the idea that we don't know everything yet. Yeah. So, um... You know, there are a number of cases in the historical record about, like, feral humans and people living in isolation who've taken on what some would call, like, quote, primitive characteristics. 
Um, and unsurprisingly, Arkansas has a historical record of wild men <laughs> recorded and rumored. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, just the idea that Cam- Arkansas has these fucking, uh, fucking alienish ape men is mm-hmm. amazing to me. I love that idea. It's like, well, we got ape men. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. There's something hilarious about it to me. Right. So um, I'm going to turn to Lyle Blackburn here again, who who writes that, quote, As Spaniards began to explore the Arkansas region starting around 1541, they wrote of encounters with Native American tribes such as the Tunica, Cado, Quapaw, and Osa- uh, Osage, or Osage? Uh, I, I don't I'm going to interrupt her for a second. We actually have Tunica, Mississippi, which is mm-hmm. uh, actually occupied by the Mississippi, Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians, Mm-hmm. And they have their own, uh, uh, what's it called? Gambling place. Casino? Casino, thank you. <laughs> they have their own casino in Tunica. And, okay. uh, I'm sorry, I've been dealing with someone and I needed to drink to deal with that person. So, Dude, I'm uh, right here talking to you. You don't have to throw me under the Not like you, that. motherfucker. <laughs> I'm talking about somebody else. I love you. The point <laughs> you is, too, the Tunica is a known tribe here in Mississippi, uh, vaguely mm-hmm. re- related to the Choctaw, which mm-hmm. I'm going to do a episode on the Choctaw uh Varian folk tales, for lack of mm-hmm. a better term, because my grandmother was descended from the Choctaw, and we're going to oh, get neat. into that later. So, so I, I do want to apologize for probably butchering those names of the. That's tribes fine. I, I don't know them. how to say any of it either. You know, I, I'm white. Osage I'm white. So, is probably Osage. the okay. correct term. So I'll, I'll go ahead and continue this quote from Blackburn. So sure. Continuing. In looking at these early tribes and others, we find that they too may have encountered wild men or Sasquatch-like creatures in the area, end quote. Now, I am not an expert on the experiences of Native Americans. Absolutely. But there seem to be many stories of wild men in Native American legend and myth. One we may have already heard of before, if you're a listener to this show, or like just, if you're listening to the show, you've probably heard of the Wendigo. Oh, yeah. Which would be a great episode on its own. Absolutely. So, we'll um, get there. So Blackburn borrows from a book by Kathy Moskowitz Strain titled Giants, Cannibals, and Monsters, Bigfoot and Native Culture. I need to get this book, by the way. Right. And what, what she does is she talks about how these tribes had specific names for such wild men or creatures in their culture. So the Kados had, uh, I'm going to butcher this, Hayayak, Hayakatsi? Hayakatsi? Hayakatsi, yes. Hayakatsi, okay. Or the Lost Giant. And then the Choctaw had Nalusa Falaya, or Big Giant. Yes. Now, I want to throw in there, like I was saying earlier, my grandmother Mm -hmm. was a Choctaw, quote-unquote, princess. Okay. The fact that she was descended from chiefs and... uh, medicine men as it were mm-hmm. and the family said she was sold to her husband a door-to-door salesman way back in the 1800s he saw her in the Whoa. window when he walked up to the house and said that may be the most pretty indian princess i've ever seen i will pay you for her and they were like yeah all right that's less one less that's one less mouth to feed so, this is a really weird fucking story. It fucking is, dude. You get down to Mississippi with this shit. It is so fucking weird. But the point is, <laughs> I wish she had been alive during the later portions of my life. Because, like, when I was growing up as a child, she was fucking ancient. She was in mm-hmm. her hundreds when I was six. Damn. I know. And there is so much weird shit she handed at. She had weird little, uh, childhood, uh, like, I don't know, like, things you would sing to people when they're going to sleep. What's the term? Mm -hmm. My brain is fucked. Lullabies? 
Lullabies, thank you. Choctaw. It's like playing Mad Libs with you today. I swear to God, <laughs> man. But like Choctaw lullabies. Mm -hmm. And I wish I remembered all of them, but there was one, one about the like, about like lizard gizzards. <laughs> and we're gonna do an entire episode about Choctaw, uh, just general beliefs, and we're gonna get into that. But for mm -hmm. now, let's move on. All right. Well, uh, okay, first of all, thank you for that, because there's oh. a lot of stuff to grapple with there, and I'm still not <laughs> sure I'm able to grapple with all of it. <laughs> I'm sure I've just confused, like, all of our listeners. I, I expect we'll probably get some more questions, like, what do you remember? Tell us more. What the fuck, dude? <laughs> yeah. Like, are, are you, are you descent? Yeah, it, it's, okay. I am um, descended from medicine, men. let's move on. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to talk about, uh, we're going to kind of wrap up here with uh, a few encounters which I'm sure we're going to enjoy because those are always fun stories to tell, these oh, wild yes. man encounters. So um, one of the first encounters with a wild man recorded after Arkansas uh, acquired statehood was published in the Arkansas Gazette and Memphis Inquirer on May 9th, 1851. So we're going back a ways. I'm always a little concerned about these because that was during the time where it's like, I'm going to make some shit up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, you know, you take these with a grain of salt, but... You know, Absolutely. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of, like, cover that, and you can make your own determination. Yeah, um, let's just go on and assume that this is real. Okay, let's do that. So, this event involved two hunters in Greene County who came upon a large, hairy animal that was trying to catch a calf in a herd of cattle. Man. When the creature realized it was being watched, it stopped and stood, staring at them. After a moment, it turned and ran. The hunters described it as having, quote, the unmistakable likeness of humanity and of, quote, gigantic stature, the body covered with hair and the head with long locks that fairly enveloped the neck and shoulders, end quote. Upon later investigation, it was reported that they found human-like tracks measuring 13 inches long, around the size of what we would consider to be like modern-day Bigfoot tracks. Wow. Now... That being said, if we want to talk about skepticism, um, one reporter suggested that the wild man was most likely a survivor of an 1811 earthquake likely gone feral. So someone who survived an earthquake and spent like the next 40 years living in the, the woods. Okay, look, I'm going to say, I have been known to go feral after a particularly harsh dump. <laughs> but, like, I don't see that a earthquake would really send someone into the woods. Now this yeah, is, uh, this... it's kind of like you know we talk about the explanations for you know well, it's, it's a pelican it's it's swamp gas reflecting off the moonlight off of a, the breath of a pelican and it's like Man. Some, sometimes those solutions seem a little more far fetched than just it was a, a wild person living in the woods. It would be more likely that a gorilla got loose from a circus, to be honest, than that description. Yeah, I'm just gonna like, say. Like, we, we can just assume from here on out, anytime we hear about, like, a Bigfoot or something, it's just a loose gorilla. Someone lost their monkey. You know what? And to be honest, I've had, like, really harsh dumps after, <laughs> like, a bad meal. I've gone feral, so, like, it could be just be someone like me. You know, it, it could very well be. You've got those locks going on right now. We've seen the harsh Kevin out there in the woods. <laughs> so, um... Another sighting uh, occurred in 1856, and it involves a man in Sevier County, north of Texarkana, being attacked by a hairy wild man. Nice. It was first reported, right. It was uh, first reported in the Caddo Gazette, and then later retold in the Hornsville Tribune, which I, I just want to pause for a second and talk about how much I love like old-timey newspaper names. Hornsville. Hornsville Tribune. Yeah, nothing but horn. <laughs> now... This event is pretty important because it's particularly well recorded and, um, you know, the events were well documented and a lot of this uh, gets kind of put into like a lot of books about big feet and that sort of thing. Um, like books about Bigfoot studies and that sort of thing. Absolutely. So, so yeah, and this is probably an account that you've, you, you're familiar with. So 
This, ev uh, this account eventually came to involve an entire party of men chasing what was described as a, quote, a stout, athletic man about six feet four inches in height, completely covered with hair of a brownish cast about four to six inches long. He was well-muscled and ran up the bank with the fleetness of a deer, end quote. All right, look, I'm not going to lie. I know people that match this, this description <laughs> these days. And uh, I could see someone chasing them, honestly. It, I mean, it, I don't know. It just it sounds like a hairy dude that I don't know today. It, it also sounds a little thirsty for the Bigfoot. It really does. It's like, he was a sexy boy running through the woods. He was a sexy, hairy man. Oh, he my God. As fast as a deer. I wish he'd run into my heart. I swear to God, I'm only saying that, like, if this man had run into me, he might not have got away. <laughs> yeah, so it's kind of like a, a little thirsty, I think. Or maybe it kind of because is. Yeah. It's sexy Bigfoot. Let's go ahead yeah. and go there. All right, so let's continue our sexy Bigfoot story. Absolutely. <laughs> so, according to the story, the party had tried to take the creature in alive... But when approached by one of the men, the creature rushed him and, quote, tore him in a most dreadful manner, scratching out one of his eyes. And, Holy quote, shit. Right. So the, the further wrinkle in this is that the creature acted violent, which is kind of rare in Bigfoot or wild man encounters. Unless you get into Alabama and Florida where you get the booger monster and the swamp ape, which is way more violent than your mm -hmm. normal Bigfoot. I mean, like, they have, like, just assaulted people's houses, assaulted right. campsites, they have attacked cabins, and I'm just saying that, like, the southern Bigfoot is way more redneck mm -hmm. than your typical Norwestern Bigfoot. Right, and our, our Boggy Creek monster, when we get into the second episode where we talk about the Falk Flap. Um, yes, which yeah, Falk definitely Flap, is in this sphere. Yeah. Falk Flap just sounds like a disease you get from right. genetics. Uh, come, here, come here and uh, disinfect my Falk Flap. Could you come put some, some, some stuff under my Falk Flap so I can go to the store today? <laughs> so, God um, damn it. So, yeah, so that, that was like one of the weirdest things about this. Um, you know, that it was like a violent encounter, because that's yes. generally rare. It gets even weirder, though. Oh, please tell so, me. So, more alarming, the creature apparently tore off a horse's saddle and bridle. Holy grabbed shit. Grabbed a switch, like literally grabbed like a twig or something, mounted the horse and rode off into the distance. <laughs> <Right>. So... <laughs> So, further evidence that this was probably a wild man and not a Bigfoot. <laughs> I'm just... Because of... <laughs> oh my god, I am just picturing a Bigfoot and assless chaps riding off into the sunset to the Will <laughs> William Tell Overture. Oh my god. <laughs> and, and what you'll find is a lot of the Bigfoot books tend to omit this part of the story. Of course they do. Nobody wants that in there. Nobody wants the Bigfoot riding a horse and assless chaps. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's amazing. It, it is a great story, because then it's like, okay, so it's weird because it gets violent. It gets even weirder because it fucking rides a horse off into the distance. <laughs> I'm breaking this up at work and seeing what my friends say about this. Holy shit. Right. It's it's such a great story, but it's one of those where it's like a portion of the story is used in a lot of Bigfoot stories, and then like they omit the part where it rides off onto a horse. <laughs> to Lyle Blackburn's credit, he does not omit this. <laughs> I love Lyle Blackburn just for that, man. Right. And, you know, it's just a further example. That's why I put this in, like, the wild men encounter portion of our attraction here. Yes. <laughs> um, so that is our second story. I have one more story for us. Oh, I can't wait for this. So our final encounter for this episode took place in about 1865 in the Oachita Mountains, I believe. That's as close um, as I can get it, man. I right. there, it's like certain certain Indian terms I can get. That one I can't. Right. Uh, so the Oachita Mountains near Saline County, Arkansas. Saline, you know, like salted water. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Salt is salty. Um, salt! So, um, so Blackburn sources this story to Otto Ernst Rayburn's 1941 book, um, like Oz- Ozark, Ozark County. Country. 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 Ozark Country. My bad. No, not a problem. So, known as the Giant of the Hills, this creature was about seven feet tall, covered in thick hair, and lived in the local caves. Now, apparently the locals found him to be frightening, but there are no, like, stories of him harming anyone. Now, because humans are dicks, and despite the peaceful nature, (laughs) apparently he was lassoed up in a cave and taken to the Benton Jail. Oh my god. They attempted to dress him, but he ripped off the clothes and escaped. (laughs) <laughs> now, <laughs> the details here are a little vague, but it was said he was captured again, but we don't have, like, a further record of this. And this, to me, is basically just the uh, the plot of the movie uh, Missing Link. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I've read, like, a lot of plays, and this is the weirdest version of Pygmalion <laughs> I have ever heard. Wouldn't it be loverly? <laughs> you know, and... I'm um, just saying, this is, this is straight up My Fair Lady... With a Bigfoot. Right. And, and um, I, like, what I find so interesting about this encounter is because, like, y- you could tell that he, uh, Otto Ernst Rayburn was working with, like, the local lore. So he was working with what he had. Instead of, like, writing a tidy ending to this, he just points out, apparently they captured it again, but we don't know what happened after that. Which, I'm going to give him a lot of credit for that because that's a lot of what uh, Jerome Clark does when there's no clear ending. He's like, well, this is where the story ends. Let's move on. Yeah, you and make that is that is interpretation. really important to me because just relating what happened versus speculation is mm-hmm. highly important to this field of research. Yeah, and that uh, like if I were teaching a uh, this. In my class, it would be like the ethos of the situation. Like exactly. The credibility. It, it says a lot about his credibility that he's not trying to editorialize there. You're a good man, David Davis, and let no one tell you otherwise. <laughs> um, so, you know, as as for these events, uh, what they actually were is likely to be a mystery for like years to come. Whether they were accounts of... Oh, yes. Right. Like, whether they were accounts of hairy bipeds, wild men, or merely stories meant to ward off local children from dangerous areas, because that's a, you find that's a common theme. That is such a good point. Thank you for bringing right. that up. What, what we do know is that these sightings of strange animal-slash-humanoid entities continue on into the 1900s and even today. But the key change is that somewhere along the line, the description drifted away from, like, the wild men to more, like, ape-like characteristics. Yes. Likely associated with a growing fascination and acceptance of the evolutionary theory. I firmly believe this because at some point we just decided that evolution was the right thing. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying Mm. that, like, at some point the... Majority of humanity decided that science was a real thing, and we should pay attention to that, and maybe mm-hmm. that's the answer to a lot of these hairy bipeds. Right, and well, it also kind of goes back to, like, things that we've mentioned numerous times about, like, the fey and uh, the superstructure in that we we, uh, we filter these phenomenons by what makes the most sense at the time. Absolutely. So back in the day, a wild guy living in the woods makes sense. If you got a bunch of white people living in the woods or uh, living in a very small community and they're worried about like um, the, the native population, maybe yeah. they're having thoughts of like a wild native person living in the woods. It's like, completely you know, inappropriate, but yeah. I, can, I can understand it. Like a lot of times, you notice today, it's like the Alabama booger monster. In the old days, <laughs> it was like Jerome. You know, they all <laughs> yeah. always had like a name. It's just right. like it went from being like an individual to a species because right. of the theory of evolution. Mm-hmm. So I totally get that. That makes sense. And it really goes along with the superstructure. Right. So I think this is kind of where we're going to pause our, our dive into Falk. We haven't talked much about the Falk flap yet uh but that's for the second episode again i'm gonna need some uh some cream to put under my foul flaps <laughs> before we go into that <laughs> um 
you know, and we're going to kind of wrap up with Charles B. Pierce as well, because there is this intimate connection between the two. You can't have one without the other. At this I point. agree. Now, having seen The Legend of Boggy Creek, now there's a lot to say about it that is negative in some way. I really, I really advise you go and watch that movie because it really <laughs> is educational. It's interesting. There's a lot of fun music involved. It's like three bucks on YouTube. It really get o- is. Get over yourself. Buy it through PayPal. Fucking like deal with it. Half. There's a great part where they talk about Watch fucking... Watch the goddamn fucking movie. Fuck. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> There's a great part about the fucking famous <laughs> hunting dogs. And I'm like, oh great. Yes. They got fucking uh, Dino Mutt and Scooby Doo and Remy Tin and Lassie. And they're all Ren, looking for the Ren monster. and Stimpy. Well, no, Stimpy was a cat. You idiot! Yes, idiot. exactly. So, <laughs> it's definitely worth checking out. I highly recommend it. Before you come back to the second episode, even if you don't watch it after this episode, I highly recommend you watch a listen to the second episode. This is an amazing subject. Definitely uh, North American related, and it's mm-hmm. a highly interesting American... Mm-hmm. uh creature well and, and today was a lot of like place setting you know it I, really I had is. to introduce i had to introduce charles we kind of drifted away from him because then we had to talk about the landscape but well the we landscape had to talk about so like so important we had to, to talk this. about why it was important to him mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. before he got into the movie so this is a right. really important episode mm-hmm. because you know, like, if you watch the original movie, there's a part of you that goes, well, this is bullshit. He made all this up. But, like, mm-hmm. once you know that there were, like, reports prior to him, it becomes so much more. Right. And, you know, uh, we're going to be covering the entirety of that, that, that couple years of encounters. We're going to talk about the movie. And then we're going to talk about the aftermath. Because, again, like... The reason we're talking about this now, um, like, is most definitely due to the movie. Like, I think we would still cover it, but probably not as much in depth. If we lived in an alternate reality, you know, where the movie was never made, I think we'd still be talking about the Falcon Monster, but just probably not in the level yeah. of detail that we're going to be covering Yeah, it'd be it. part of a southeastern uh, paranormal Bigfoot thing. Now, I want to point episode out... Would be, that episode would be of Boogers and Boggy... Creek. Yes, Boogers and Boggy Creek. Now, I want to point out, if you guys are interested, at the Bigfoot Festival in Natchez, where myself and Clark Wayne are going to be, we have got a special VIP table, and we're going to be at a lot of the events. They are playing The Legend of Boggy Creek as the second movie out the at the outside drive-in, so please that is fantastic. If you can make it, I highly highly recommend it because holy shit, that movie is something else. It's something to see. <laughs> okay, like I think me and David both have seen it. It is definitely worth checking out. I mean, there's stuff to make fun of, but it's also like there's so much heart in it. And that's what makes a bad movie good is when, like, the person making it is, like, really, like, knee-deep in it. Well, and I wouldn't even say it's a bad movie. Like, it It's is, not. It's like, a there, good there's movie. There's some stuff that, like, obviously could be done better. You know, there's some aspects of it that are kind of amateurish when you think about it now. Well, I but mean, it was then, made like, in the 70s. Compelling. It was made in the 70s, so you have mm-hmm. to accept a certain level well, of low it, budget. It, it's it's an Arkansas film of the 1970s. Holy Arkansas shit. wasn't Hollywood. No, no, so. it wasn't, but he went a long way toward making this something to watch. Mm-hmm. So I highly recommend watching it or coming down to the Natchez Bigfoot Birthday Bash. That sounds like so much fun. I swear to God. And we're going to have a table there. Me and Clark Wayne are going to be there. I highly recommend you come down, talk to us, watch the movies. There are going to be a lot of uh, professional Bigfoot hunters from the Discovery Channel and History Channel there. I assume you're going to get 
some recording done, like asking them questions, right? Oh God, be, like, yes. Episode, yeah. I have got my recording kit right here next to me. I'm holding it in my fucking hand. This yes is happening. We're gonna make this the best live episode we can for the time being. So please, if you can make it down there to see it before we record, I highly recommend you come to Natchez, Mississippi for the Bigfoot Festival. Check it out. There's a Facebook page and a website. We have got uh, private episodes. Private episodes. We've got uh, <laughs> live episodes that will be recorded. It's going to be amazing. Private episodes, podcasting for money, do what you want us to do. Yes, absolutely. I will <laughs> fucking jerk it to get your money. I don't <laughs> care. Uh, we oh, no. have, we still only have one Patreon to the episode. David Holyfield, thank you again for being king of the podcast. You were awesome. We love you so much. Tell us how Evander is doing. What's that? I, I was making a Evander Holyfield reference. Okay, that's great. I don't <laughs> get the he, joke. He's, he's David Holyfield. Yeah, tell us how Evander is. I'm sorry, it was a stupid joke. That's why I bring to. No, it's okay, man. I am like tired and out of my mind right now, so I'm gonna assume <laughs> everybody gets your joke but me. So, <laughs> uh, David, let's go with you real quick. Where can people find your material, your amazing stuff, and your child's play podcast? All right, well, um, so I just recently launched a Child's Play podcast for the website Haunted MTL. Um, it's a Canadian horror website. I uh, write articles and such over there. I do a lot of uh, Joe Bob Briggs recaps, and Shudder actually contacted us. They gave us a uh, promo code. I, I can't give it out yet, but because we uh, they, they apparently like the recaps that I write, so... That That's is fun. so fucking awesome, dude. But the um, but the podcast, it's all about child's play. You were my first guest. Yes. Um, we. I am we so talk happy about all things that. Chucky. Yes. And uh, I plan on covering all the movies. I have a couple one-off episodes, and I'm going to be covering the TV show. I cannot tell you how happy I am to have been on that first episode because it gave me a chance to go back and watch the first movie, mm -hmm. and. If you're not a big horror fan and you're listening to this, you need to go back and watch Chucky. I mean, I know mm. it seems silly. Oh, a doll. But, like, once you get into it, mm -hmm. it's fucking scary, dude. Right. It's a fucking so, doll um, like killing people, man. So, uh, what you can do is you can go to Haunted MTL and under podcast you'll see Kids' Stuff, a Chucky <laughs> podcast. <laughs> We're going to be getting that on uh, um, Spotify, uh, iTunes, all of the aggregators. Uh, I have to wait for a couple episodes first because I want to take advantage of that, like, premiere promotion thing because iTunes will, like, bump up the podcast. But if you only have one episode up, it's kind of a waste. Absolutely. Look, if you need some help with that, let me know. I obviously mm -hmm. have a little experience with that. Uh, yes, you do. I can say right off the bat that I had so much fun doing that first episode. I can only imagine the second episode with Gage is amazing. You guys need to check this out. Mm -hmm. uh, it will change your viewpoint on the Child's Play uh, septology. Is that the term I'm looking for? Yeah, because there are seven films, although, like, how do you factor in the, the TV show into all this? Stuff? I don't know. There's the trilogy, exactly. and then the blank of Chucky films, and the mm -hmm. TV show, which I watched the most recent trailer, and holy shit, I'm down. And, like, it's bringing, like, everything together, but, you yeah. know, that, that's a subject for another podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah. A whole <laughs> but, um, other series. Yes. Uh, uh, that... That being said, you can also find me on the social media as uh, at HPKOMIC, HP Comic. You can also listen to my radio show on Deviant Behavior Radio called The Mutant Hours. One of our most uh, successful shows, by the way. We love The Mutant Hours. You need to check it out. Yeah, and you can, uh, you can catch that on Mondays and Wednesdays on midnight uh, at midnight central time um, you know, on Deviant Behavior Radio. Uh, I, I like to do little goofy theme shows. I think uh, last week was a Twin Peaks remix tribute, where it's just mm -hmm. a, a tribute album, you know, of different songs remixed. It was it was a great show. Like I had a ton of fun with it, 
and I'm probably going to try to do an anime night this month. That is awesome, because you know how I feel about anime. Anime? Mm -hmm. Alame? What the fuck? Alame? Alame! Anime, get back in the trailer. Get back into that damn house right now, you bitch. So, uh, sorry, I'm, like, trying to fucking deal with what I've dealt with today. Anyway, the point is, thank you, David. Of course. I love you, you, buddy. You were one of the best co-hosts ever. You and Mike are, like... That, like, if I had to divide my heart into three people, it would be me, you, and Mike. Aww. Aww. So, if you're interested in catching up on anything, sending information, you can find us at supernatpod.rocks. R-O-C-I... I. What the fuck? R-O-C-K-S. <laughs> Supernatpod... Dot R-O-C-K-S. And we also have the uh, question form. It's a form where you can send information to us if you have any questions for the podcast. Mike is getting very, very uh, impatient for questions. So please <laughs> send he, some he's questions. He's starting to get a little uh, angry now. I, so am watching, us. I am watching him chew or owen's courting right now so please send some questions <laughs> so he doesn't give himself mesothelioma uh <laughs> beyond that if you'd like to get in touch with us you can hit us up at that bastage b-a-s-t-a-g-e <laughs> dot supernatural pod dot com jesus christ I've had a long day. Anyway, point it is... It sounds like the alcohol is finally getting to you. You are not wrong. You find us at SupernaturalSelectionPod.com or SupernatPod.rocks. We have a link where you can select the form and send us questions. You can hit up Mike at SkepticalMike at Supernat. Pod, uh, SupernaturalSelectionPod.com Holy shit, I need a nap. <laughs> and, <laughs> anyway, the point is, head to SupernaturalSelectionPod.com You can find all the links, including to our Patreon, which includes early episodes, and bonus podcasts as soon as we get bonus Patreons. So please consider donating at the 10 or higher level, and we will start recording episodes about, like, Jerome Clark and all sorts of fun things. Uh, So I think that's about it. David, you got anything else to say, buddy? No, just uh, stay tuned for part two of our first two-parter. I am so excited that I am the one... Listen, listen, I want you to know one thing. Yeah. I want you to look at me. Yeah. I'm I'm the captain now. You're the captain? I'm the captain. I'm licking your chode right now because you're the captain. Oh, no. You're the captain. (laughs) This is not where I wanted it to go, but okay. (laughs) Too fucking bad. This is where it goes. (laughs) So, seriously, I'm excited that we're going into our first two-part episode about something as amazing as the Falk Monster. We'll be back next week with part two. After that, I think we're going to tackle chalk. Ta folk tales. Because being as my grandmother was a part Choctaw, I think it's time we launch into some of her philosophy. There you go. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it. Remember, guys, we love all of you. Agape, not Eros. And we will see you next time. So until then, stay frosty. Goodbye. There's a stop button. There's a stop button somewhere around here, goddammit. What the fuck is it? Supernatural Selection has been a production of DeviantBehaviorRadio.com. You can find it and more shows broadcast weekly at DeviantBehaviorRadio.com. Our theme music is Screensaver by Kevin McLeod. It is used 
through Creative Commons license, and more of his music can be found at incompetech.filmmusic.io.